engineer life, uh, you want to engineer the, the, the genet genetic software of cells, you need to be able to read and write it, just like a so computer software code. And so reading DNA used to be extremely expensive. So to enable synthetic biology, it was very important that those costs went down. And they did. Because as you can see, this y-axis is not a normal y-axis. It's actually, every step represents a tenfold decrease. So what used to cost one billion US dollars to sequence a human genome, now cost only a few hundred dollars. And as we speak, new DNA sequencing, so DNA reading technologies are under development. The expectation is that not so far in the future, uh, it will basically cost almost nothing to read your own DNA. And as a result, we've not been only interested in ourselves, we've basically scanned the genetic source code of all the organisms in our environment, from dolphins, fish, bananas, butterflies, plants, uh, cute little puppies, uh, and that's very interesting because in that data, we can find some very interesting genes encoding for all the things nature makes and does. And all those codes are now stored in an online beta database that is a very interesting resource for a scientist like myself. Because I can get quite creative with this. Now using the database, I can copy and paste uh, pieces of DNA, genes, or other genetic information from different organisms, literally, control C, control V, and placing them in a new order. I can make my own genetic design. Now, I don't want this design to stay in my computer, but I can transform it into actual physical DNA, because DNA is a chemical that can be synthesized. And so there are companies that take my code and assemble the DNA letters in exactly the order that I made on my computer. And just like reading DNA, also this writing of DNA became quite affordable. So if I order a typical gene from any organism, it will cost me about 100 euros. What I then get is that a little tube like this is sent to my lab, I add some water to it, and I can use it to transform, for example, this bacterium into a cellular factory. Depending on the DNA software that I chose to, to write, for example, I could have taken a piece of code from a stevia plant to, pay, to make a sweetener, or what about the genes for making spider silk, or an anti-malaria drug that this plant makes. After delivering the piece of DNA to the bacteria, the bacteria will start to produce exactly the bioproduct that the original organism used to make. And what's nice about bacteria or other microbes is that they can live on very cheap sources of food. So we can let them grow on sugar or maybe even better on waste. And they also don't take a lot of space. We can put them in big bioreactors and they will take up a lot less space than, for example, plants. And because biology has become digitized and demonetized, we are truly living a cyber biological revolution at the moment. So this cycle of making a DNA design, placing it into an organism and testing the organism for its function is really accelerated at the moment with the help of artificial intelligence and robotics. Because with robotics, we can, we can test many more DNA designs at the same time. And with AI, we can make better DNA design choices. And that brings me to my third D, which is the D of disruption. We've become so good at engineering living systems that the consequence is that now an entirely new industry is being, creative, be, being created. And so these are some of the companies that are currently working with the more established companies to make synthetic biology products of the future. For example, these synthetic biology companies are working together with some very famous fashion brands such as the North Face, Stella McCartney or Adidas to make fashion based on spider silk. A spider silk is a very interesting material, but you can imagine that harvesting it from millions of spiders is not very efficient and also not very profitable. So these companies are using microbes that can make the spider silk instead. 
And what's very interesting about doing it this way is that you can make small edits in the DNA of the spider silk genes to make thousands of different versions of the spider silk, such that it's not only interesting as a more sustainable material in fashion, but also can be used as a high-performance material in airplanes. So Amsilk and Airbus are already discussing on how to use spider silk for the improvement of the, of the outer skin of the plane, because the material is very flexible, stronger than steel, and very light. It could be very interesting to use. But it also has antibacterial properties that might be of use for the inside of the plane. Uh, for example, to make passenger seats from. Now, engineering cells as living factories is also interesting if we want to produce biofuels. Because honestly, our biofuels are typically not very sustainable today. In many cases, tropical rainforests are still cut down, or we are using plants that could also serve as a source for food. It seemed, therefore, the perfect solution to use algae to make biodiesel, because algae convert CO2 and sunlight into oil and do not compete with, food, with crops for food. But unfortunately, many of the algae pioneering companies went, went bankrupt because of the cheap fossil fuels, and so there are very few companies left who still believe that this is possible. And one of them is uh, the American company Synthetic Genomics, who's working with ExxonMobil to create biofuels from algae. But they tinkered with the algae genome for nearly 10 years to increase the oil content with twofold. And that, they think that if you invest long enough, they can actually make algae fuel a reality. But it's an example that you know, shows that you really have to have a long-term vision in order for a hype to be realized. Now, I've said enough about using cells as factories. What we can also do is actually just use the DNA and use it to store information. Because at the moment, we have a huge data storage problem. Now, already 2013, we had about 75 million servers. I'm sure that number is a lot bigger today. I just couldn't find it. But Instead of storing all that information in servers, we could also just take one kilogram of DNA, and that would take up a lot less space, right? And this might actually be very useful, because you would also not have to worry about ever losing your data again, because DNA can last something like a thousand years. Now, research has become very, very interested in this, and there are many scientists around the world who are trying to find uh, very efficient ways of storing data in DNA. And uh, just a week ago, I found an article in Nature Biotechnology where some Israeli researchers managed to store 10 million gigabytes into a single gram of DNA. Now, in theory, that means that you could store the entire content of YouTube into a teaspoon of DNA. That's incredible. 